Okay, so um, there are more problems from this standard model worksheet. It's also a longer worksheet than from the mass energy equivalence worksheet. So this is video two of two walking through the solutions from that problem set. So here I just included this um, standard model worksheet because we don't need the worksheet from the previous video. So here's page one once again. Then we have page two. Then we have three. That always happens. Three and four and five and six. Is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. So then you have page one of the reference tables. Page one, page two, page three, page four. Page five, page six. All right, so let's get going. Number one of the four fundamental forces in nature, we have electromagnetic, and that governs bonds. That's electric force and magnetic force, so pretty much what holds most things together, um, like molecular bonds, like uh, I'm pretty sure every single bond that you learned about in chemistry is, is covered by the electromagnetic force. Then we have the gravitational force, which is uh, the longest range of the forces, but the weakest of the bunch. You need huge amounts of mass to really have an appreciable effect with gravity. Um, gravity also only attracts. There's no repulsive gravity, which is interesting. Um, then you have nuclear weak force, which is uh, deals with like uh, particle decay and, and whatnot and nuclear processes and then the nuclear strong force which is what this question is about it's the strongest force in nature it holds the nucleus of the atom together it's extremely short range it really only acts on the uh, range of the on the order of the size of the nucleus itself that's actually why large nuclei are radioactive is that the nucleus starts to get larger than the range of the nuclear strong force. The nucleus gets larger uh, than the range of the force that is holding it together. So it's really not being held together that, that well anymore, and particles start to escape, um, hence the radioactivity. But anyway, so uh, one says strong force is the force of, and that, that strong force holds the nucleus together so that it's an attractive force, and it's a force between nucleons, things that are found in the nucleus. Electrons are not found in the nucleus. Electrons are leptons. So it's this, the force of attraction between nucleons. Choice one. And just as a side note about the nuclear strong force, like why does it have to be strong? You have to remember that neutrons don't affect each other. They're neutral. But protons repel each other. They're both positive. And so that's an electrostatic repulsive force. And we know about the inverse square law, that as the protons get closer to each other, that force of repulsion gets stronger exponentially. So think about it. When you have protons packed into a tight nucleus, they are so close to each other, they are pushing off of each other, they want nothing to do with each other. So according to the electrostatic force, nuclei should not exist. We should not be here. But the cool thing about nuclear strong force is that the protons repel each other, they get closer, they really repel each other, they get closer, they really, really, really repel each other, they can't stand each other. But then when they get really, really close, on uh, the order of the size of the nucleus, boom, nuclear strong force takes over, and they are locked together. It's kind of like a couple who, you know, like they're, you know, people that like, like each other, and they're always fighting, and they're fighting, but the reason why they're fighting is because they actually kind of like each other, and then in the end, you know, it's like these two kids, two friends of yours that are always, like, bickering with each other, but in the end, like, years later, oh, they got married, and it's like, why? Because they, once they got closer to each other, and then they're just like, oh, I actually love you, and yeah, that's probably a stupid analogy, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the point, is they get those protons, they repel, get closer, repel, get closer, repel, but then get really close, and then nuclear strong takes over, and boom, they lock together, make a nucleus, and the world is happy. Number two, tau neutrino, muon neutrino, electron neutrino are all what? Well, let's check the reference table.
something tells me it's not the first time we're going to be looking at this, this thing for the problem set. So all of the neutrinos, they are all over here, electron, muon, tau neutrino. And what kind of particle are those guys? Lepton. So that's choice one. All right, number three, lambda particle is an up and down and a strange quark. Uh, what kind of particle is that? Well, it's made up of three quarks, and if it's three quarks, it must be a baryon choice one. Again, let's refer back to our reference table here, page three. It says up, down, and strange quark that is three quarks, and so therefore it has to be a baryon choice one. Uh, before I go back and write that down, I just want to take a look at number four. Uh, charge of a lambda particle in elementary charges. It says up, down, and strange quark. So those are the quarks right there, up, down, and strange. Up is plus two-thirds E, down and strange are both negative one-third E. So that lambda particle being made up of up, down, and strange is plus two-thirds, minus a third, minus a third gets me zero elementary charges. It's neutral. Okay, number five. Um, this is talking about a particle exchange, I want to write this down. Having it as like a narrative is not really helpful. So let's see what we have here. So we have a neutron that decays into a proton, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. Now the problem refers to the uh, neutron and the proton in terms of their quarks. I'm going to do the same neutron up, down, down. Proton is up, up, down plus electron, plus electron antineutrino. It's looking more like the V for velocity. So the question wants to know, was an up quark turned into a down quark? No, I would say actually that a down quark turned into an up quark. So um, yeah, it's not uh, up to down, maybe the other way around. So it's not choice one. Down quark to a meson. There's no mesons on the right side of the equation, so that's not true. A meson is a quark and an anti-quark. Um, from one baryon to another baryon, yeah, I would say so. We are going from a neutron to a proton. They're both baryons. They're both three quarks. Um, so that seems like the answer. And then choice four says lepton to another lepton. I don't have a lepton to start with. A lepton is generated on the right side, but a neutron is not a, a lepton. It's a baryon. So three, baryon to baryon. Seven, which combination of quarks could produce a neutral baryon? Uh, so you gotta walk through these quarks and see what they make, let's see. So first of all, they're all um, variable, uh, viable, I'm sorry, viable baryons. They're made up of three quarks and they all add up to a whole number of charge. But the question number seven says, which one is neutral? And choices one, two, and four all come to plus one E. So the neutral guy is choice three coming in at zero elementary charges. So that is choice three. And again, uh, to be clear, all of these charges are coming from page three of the reference table, the quark chart. So number eight is talking about a meson. It says, which charge is not possible for a meson? So don't forget that a meson is a quark and an anti-quark, and an anti-quark has the charge opposite that of a regular quark. And no matter how you combine the different quarks, whether they be up charm or top, or down strange or bottom, um, no matter how you combine them, you can only make negative one, zero, or plus one. It is not possible to make plus two. Um, you can try, it's not gonna work. So a meson cannot have a charge of plus two, um, that's not just a fact to memorize, you just can't do it. With a quark and an into quark, it's just not possible to work that out with the charges as they are. So plus 2e is not possible. Number nine. Okay, so here's the layout. I use the symbol for electron antineutrino because I didn't feel like writing it out. Um, but it says, based on conservation laws, how does the mass of the neutron compare to the mass of the proton? The neutron has to be heavier because from the one neutron we wind up with, a proton, an electron, which has a much lower mass than the proton, but has some mass, an electron antineutrino, which has teeny tiny mass, but it has some mass, and some energy. So from, and that energy came from the mass of the neutron. So the, from that neutron came all this stuff. So the neutron must have larger mass than the proton. And then 10 says, 
And since charge conserves in the reaction, what must be the charge of the electron antineutrino? Well, first of all, neutrinos are neutral, and antiparticles of neutral particles are also neutral. So we know that the electron antineutrino is neutral. Um, so it's neutral. It doesn't say why. It just says what charge. So you could write neutral, but I'll explain why, and that's really what they're getting at. And so we start with a neutron on the left side, and then that neutron produces a proton and an electron. So the neutron is neutral and it makes a positive particle that violates conservation of charge. You can't make positive out of neutral, but not only do I make a positive charge, I also make a negative charge. I make the electron. That satisfies conservation of charge. So now I have neutral on the left and neutral on the right. Therefore, that electron antineutrino, that, I just keep on messing up the symbol, but the electron antineutrino, that has to be neutral um, by conservation of charge. So that guy right there, neutral. I wrote P positive for the proton. If I wanted to write positron or the elect anti-electron, I would write E positive. Um, or E negative with a bar over it or something like that. But P, P positive means proton. Okay, let's skip on over to number 19. All right, so 19 wants the charge of an anti-strange quark in coulombs. It seems really funky, but it's really not that tough. First, we need the charge of a strange quark. From the bottom of page 3 of the reference table, I can see that a strange quark is negative one-third elementary charge. If it's an anti-strange quark, then it's positive one-third elementary charge. So one-third of uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs is 5.53 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, or 5.33 times 10 to the negative 20 coulombs, and it's positive because it's an anti-strange quark. Um, so that would be choice one. Now be careful here. I don't like these. The hard part was getting the 5.33, and all anti-choices of 5.33 so we have to pick positive because it's anti but I don't like that they have a positive 5.33 times 10 to the negative 20 and positive 5.33 times 10 to the 20 um, just that little tiny negative sign missing in the exponent I could see somebody picking that quickly you have to read carefully I think that's a bit of a trap the way they set set that up I would have set it up differently but I didn't make the question next number 20 20 is easy, 20 is going to be choice 3, strong force. Um, I mentioned that earlier about how the nuclear strong force holds the protons and neutrons together. Um, I already went through all that, I'm not going to rehash it. 20 is choice 3. 21 is a good question that consists of simple addition and people always mess it up anyway. Um, total number of quarks in a helium nucleus with two protons and two neutrons. Well, a proton and a neutron, we know, are baryons. A proton is up, up, down, and a neutron is up, down, down. You're not responsible for memorizing that quark content, but I see so many questions about protons and neutrons, you might as well be responsible for memorizing the quark content of a proton and a, and a neutron. Um, so, let's see. So each of those guys is a baryon, and they have three quarks apiece. So if I have two protons and two neutrons, that's up, up, down, up, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, down. Um, and so that the total number of quarks right there is 12. So 24 says, what's the sign of charge in coulombs of an antiproton? Well, we know that a proton is plus one elementary charge. And we know that an elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, and then it says an antiproton. Well, antimatter has the opposite charge sign, but same mass has its regular matter counterpart. So antiproton, antiproton would be negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Before we do number 25, Julia came by. She wanted to say hi on my video. Hi. Yeah, so she's this Just, is Ted. Oh yeah, Ted's is here too, but we he's not actually this isn't video so you can't see him. But Ted's yeah. Ted's yeah. doesn't talk. Yeah, and Ted's is a bear. Yeah, and Ted is a bear. 
Yeah. So. Hey, Dad, can I hear the video? <laughs> so, 25, bye. they have a, bye. They have a deuterium nucleus with a proton and a neutron. And it says, what is that in terms of quarks? This is why I said before, it's good to know what the quark content of a proton and neutron are. Uh, so let's see, we have one proton, one neutron. So when you throw that together, you get three up quarks and three down quarks. That's choice three. It would be, uh, de, 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 I, I guess. I don't think you actually pronounce the quarks. Uh, moving on, number 26. Which particles are not affected by the strong force? Well, I know that hadrons are affected by the strong force, so definitely not choice one. And protons and neutrons are examples of baryons, and baryons are hadrons. And I can see that on the chart on page three of the reference table. In our classification of matter chart, matter is either a hadron or a lepton. Hadrons are broken into baryons and mesons, and protons and neutrons are examples of baryons. So protons, neutrons, and hadrons they are all subject to the nuclear strong force, but the electron is a lepton, and the lepton is not affected by the nuclear strong force. So 26 is choice four. All right, let's jump to number 36. We have a table of particles here. And it says, which particle has opposite charge of and is more massive than a proton? Well, proton is a positive 1e. So opposite that would be um, negative 1e. And so that leaves us with either antiproton or omega. And But we can see from the masses on the table that the antiproton has the same charge, same mass <clears throat> as the proton does. And I want something that's more massive. So from the chart, I see that my answer is the omega particle choice four. But I didn't even need the chart for that in terms of the mass, um, because I can see that the proton and the antiproton um, have the same mass from, from the chart, but I also know that antiparticles have the same mass as their corresponding normal mass particles. Um, so I know that the antiproton would not be the right answer because of that. And so we have omega particle. Next question. So I can see that of all of the particles on the chart, the one thing that they have in common is that they all have uh, three uh, quarks. Even the antiproton that's made up of antiquarks, it has three of them. Um, and so <clears throat> they're all considered to be baryons. Technically, the antiproton is an antibaryon, um, but baryon is not a choice anyway. Um, and uh, so that would be, therefore, hadron. Uh, they're not mesons because they're not quark and antiquark. They're definitely not leptons. And they're not all antimatter, only the antiproton is. So that makes them all hadrons choice too. Again, I'm throwing around lepton, hadron, baryon as if like everybody knows what I'm talking about. But honestly, that's right there on the bottom left of the page three, the reference table, where it says that hadrons are made up of baryons and mesons, and a baryon has three quarks. It says it right there. And so, speaking of page three of the reference tables, we have number 38. According to the standard model of particle physics, a meson is a quark and an anti-quark. Um, its quarks don't combine up with muon neutrinos or any neutrinos. Um, three quarks is a thing, but that's a baryon, not a meson. And leptons and antileptons don't pair up into a particle. So we have quark and anti-quark, choice two. 39. Interesting way of asking this question. Particle unaffected by an electric field. That means it has no charge. It has to be neutral. And all four of these guys have three quarks. They're all baryons. I have to see which one is going to give me a neutral charge breakdown. So looking at all the quark breakdowns, um, they're all viable particles. I have zero, negative one, positive one, and positive one. <clears throat> but the one that's neutral um, that would not be affected by an electric field is the charm, strange, strange, choice one. And again, all of those charges come from page three of the reference table. Look at the quark chart. Um, now, 41, lithium is three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. What is that about? Um, again, let's get that quark breakdown. 
So yeah, that's three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. The electrons are leptons, um, so I'd have three leptons, that gives me either choice three or choice four. But um, the protons and neutrons, uh, they're all, a proton and a neutron is an example of a baryon with three quarks. So if I have three protons, that is nine quarks. And then if I have four neutrons, and that is 12 quarks, and so 9 and 12 together makes for 21 quarks and 3 leptons for lithium, choice 4. So 42 wants to know the charge of a top quark in coulombs. We, so we did this before with a different quark. Top is plus 2 thirds E. So 42, that top quark, that comes out to positive 1.07 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and that is choice 3. Just be careful that you don't pick choice one. It's a positive particle. And that plus two-thirds E, again, I got from page three of the reference table. 43, we're looking for a meson of negative one, so I want a quark and an anti-quark, so it's either choice one or choice three. Just to comment on choice four with the bar over the up, the charm, and the down, that would be an anti-baryon. That's three anti-quarks put together. But it said meson, so forget choice four. It's either choice one or choice three. And so I worked out the math. Strange is negative one third and charm is positive two thirds, but it's anti, so it's negative. And so the strange anti charm is negative one E. The up anti bottom is positive one E. And it's looking for a negative one, so that would be choice one. Incidentally, you can also double check your work. If you work out these particles and they don't come out to a whole number of charge, you know you messed something up. Um, because any particle, whether it be a baryon or a meson, has to come out to a whole number of charge. Elementary charge, not Coulomb. I think we have just enough room for 44 and 45. I may need to squeeze 45 in the corner. 44, pair production, energetic gamma ray converted to electron and positron. Uh, you can't make two electrons. Why? Um, and that's a violation of conservation of charge. Light has no charge. So gamma ray is a super energetic light photon, but it's still electrically neutral no matter what. Um, and if I have a neutral particle to start, uh, whatever it produces also has to come out neutral. That's conservation of charge. And so if it makes an electron and a positron, that's a negative and a positive, those balance out to neutral. But if it makes two electrons, you're starting from neutral and making two negatives, that, that violates conservation of charge, so it's not going to work. 44 is choice one. So we have an antibaryon with two anti-ups and one anti-down. We know an up is plus two thirds E and a down is negative one third E. And if the up is positive two thirds, the anti-up is negative two thirds. And if the down is negative one third, the anti-down is positive one third. So when they throw those guys together, negative two thirds, negative two thirds, and positive one third, I wind up with negative one elementary charge. You may have figured out um, that is an antiproton. If a proton is up, up, down, the antiproton would be anti-up, anti-up, anti-down. And whereas a proton is plus one, the antiproton would be minus one. So that's it. That's it for this uh, solutions video. That's it for solutions videos overall. That's it for regions physics. Um, and I'm going to put together a different video where I say goodbye, but um, I hope that you learned something. I hope that you learned physics, um, but I also hope that you learned other things too, you know, um, in working with your peers and working with me. Um, I feel like this time is, was trying and, uh, and I think we all learned something about ourselves. Um, and you know, it's like for, for better or for worse, but you know, that learning, that opportunity to, to, to learn that is, uh, is way more valuable um, than anything you could learn in a physics class. And that's the truth of it. So enjoy your summer. You could be playing baseball. You could be cooling off with your AC system or fan. You could be making <clears throat> educreations videos on your iPad while your daughter bounces around the room. But point being, um, I hope you enjoy your summer. You certainly have deserved it. Uh, congratulations on finishing your junior year. 
And uh, for a couple of you, congratulations on finishing your senior year and for finishing high school. Um, and uh, it's interesting times for sure. Um, but I think what doesn't break us makes us stronger. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I hope to see for the, for the rest of you juniors, I hope to see your faces in the building uh, next year. Uh, we'll see what September brings. But um, this remote learning, like, we got to get back to face-to-face -face contact. Um, but safely. And uh, we have to be patient. But, um, but yeah, like, I hope to see your faces again soon. All right. Thank you. And, uh, and have a great summer.